Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading stories from the psych ward. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. When I was doing psych clerkship as a med student, there was a schizophrenic patient with the usual signs. Auditory hallucinations, disheveled appearance, no expression on his face. He admitted to voices talking to him. The resident I was shadowing asked him what the voices say to him, and he refused to answer that question. Then she informed him that they can give him some medications to make the voices go away, and he immediately rebuked that option. Mind you, still displaying no expression on his face the whole time. When the resident asked him why, he replied, They are my only friends. My mom told me this story from her time at a neuropsychiatric ward while she was in grad school. She was making her routine room checks and happened upon the most horrific scene I've ever heard of. This was during the night shift, and generally all the patient's bedroom doors should be closed. So my mom turned a corner and noticed an open door. She saw a staff member's legs on the floor, halfway out the doorway. When she looked into the room, she saw the patient a woman with severe postpartum psychiatric disorder who had just gouged both of her own eyes out with her bare hands. She was sitting cross-legged on the floor, holding her eyes in her hands. The first staff member to witness the scene who was now lying face down on the floor had a heart attack when he first witnessed the woman while he was making his rounds. My mom screamed for help and frantically tried to perform CPR on the staff member. All the while, The woman just sat rather calmly, holding her own eyes. We had a young lady in our custody with quite a few issues. We'll call her Jane. Jane's first night at our facility staff doing a bed check found Jane in a puddle of blood. Turns out, Jane had been slicing the skin around her shin with her fingernails and was pulling her skin up her leg, essentially degloving her calf. Jane also had a ritual she performed every night before bed. While in her room, she would run between walls in her room touching them in a crucifix pattern. After doing this for a few hours, she would sit on her bed and go to sleep. This particular night, Jane was frantic in her pace, practically running between walls. Our night staff observed the entire interaction and reported Jane screaming late into the night. When the staff went to check on Jane, she reported Jane standing in the doorway smiling. The staff asked what was wrong, and Jane replied, What makes you think you're speaking to Jane? My mom worked in a mental institution in her younger years, and she actually worked at a large, well-known asylum before it was shut down. There was one woman there that thought that she was a vampire of sorts. She was only allowed out one hour a day, and they had to use safety precautions. She had already attacked and killed at least one hospital worker before these were enacted. When my mom asked about her, it was revealed that she had killed at least two of her children, wounded another as well as her husband, because she had some sort of physical condition called porphyria, which apparently made her crave blood. By the time they had discovered there was something physically wrong with her, she already had lost her mind 
from both guilt and grief. I had an hour-long conversation with a delusional guy who was confined to a mental health facility and who was probably smarter than I am. Lots of these folks believe that somebody, often the CIA, is either beaming thoughts into their heads or has implanted a microchip in their brains for this purpose. This guy was offering a very thoughtful argument as to why such claims should not be so quickly dismissed. It's precisely because such delusions are so common that mental patients are the best test subjects, he said. There he was, confined and protected, constantly observed, his health and behavior documented, and there is zero chance that anyone would ever take his concerns seriously. How else would you test and improve such technology? Does the government not have a strong motivation and a plausible ability to create such a device? You can see I'm not irrational, the man said. I'm just straight up telling you that they are doing this to me. I know just how unbelievable it sounds. And yet, here I am. As a tech in psych years ago, there was a seven-year-old kid sent to the floor because the mom didn't know what to do with him. Sadly, common thing to happen, even if the kids don't have psych issues. Anyway, the mom was shaking and crying, and they had to take the kid into another room. She was genuinely afraid of her own son. She had suspected something was wrong when she kept finding mutilated animals in the backyard, but never heard or saw coyotes or anything around. The neighbor's smaller pets started disappearing. The boy had an obsession with knives, hiding them around the house, denying anything when the mom confronted him. Then, when the two started getting into arguments, he would get really violent and hit her, push her down and kick her, threaten to kill her. On multiple occasions, she woke up in the middle of the night with him standing beside her bed, staring her in the face. She put extra locks on her bedroom door to feel safe while she slept. The last straw was when she lifted up his mattress and found 50 plus knives of all shapes and sizes under there. So she brought him to us. I remember talking to him, treating him like he was any other kid that came through. He seemed remarkably normal until you spoke directly to him. He had this way of looking right through you, or maybe like he didn't see you at all while you were speaking. He would respond like a robot like he was just saying words because that's what we wanted to hear. And he would always put on this creepy, dead-looking smile, like all mouth and no eye movement in the smile. Especially when he would get away with something, like taking another kid's markers and they couldn't figure it out. Still gives me chills laying here thinking about him. I truly believe that I met a seven-year-old psychopath. I was a pharmacy technician at a hospital with a psych ward for some time. We would have to go around with a cart and dispense the patient's medications. And being a five foot two girl, a security guard or male nurse would accompany me, just as a precaution. I never had any real issues other than the occasional death grip onto my arm or manic outbursts. But there was one boy who was entirely different. His chart said that he was nine and he had pale skin, dark hair, and huge bright green eyes. He always greeted me in the most polite way, asked how I was doing, and always found something different to compliment me on every time. He was extremely well-spoken and mature for his age, so I began looking forward to seeing him, as normal small talk is definitely cherished in that setting. If he saw me outside of his room in the halls, he'd make sure to say hello, and always called me Miss Jones or Ma'am. One day, a couple of our female nurses saw me pause to chat with him in the hallway and waved me over to ask if I was out of my mind. Apparently, he was in kindergarten, 
He grew an intense attachment to his young female teacher. This escalated to the point of him calling her mom and leaving notes for her about how he wished he were her son. He had a normal home life with both parents, and the teacher tried to explain to him that she couldn't be his mom because that would hurt his real mother's feelings and that she already had the job covered. So, he went home and killed his own mother in her sleep by cutting her throat so his teacher could be his mom. The female staff had a general rule of not interacting with him excessively to prevent any kind of attachment from forming. Nothing I can say can possibly describe the year that I worked in psychiatric intensive care. Creepy isn't the thing that comes close to mind when I think back on it. More heartbreaking and horrifying. But creepiness was part of it. Especially evening and night shifts, naturally. There was always something disturbing about watching someone while they hallucinate. You can tell that it's 100% real to them. And something about that makes you believe it on some level. A lot of stories end with, and of course, I had to look over my shoulder to make sure. You see the emotions that it brings out. There was a woman that came in and sat down across the table from me for her admission interview. She had bandages all over her arms and scotch tape over her mouth and ears. She looked very uncomfortable and wouldn't really sit still. When the nurse would ask her a question, she would peel the corner of the tape back and answer then stick the tape back on really fast. We eventually found out that she saw and felt bugs crawling all over her, and they were trying to get inside of her body. The tape was to keep the bugs out. The bandages were because some bugs got in and she had to dig them out. She couldn't sit still because she felt the bugs crawling all over her, even while we sat and talked. The worst part was she had some idea that her mind was playing tricks on her, Can you imagine going through your life feeling like someone is continuously dumping buckets of cockroaches on your head, feeling like they're all over you and getting inside of you to the point that you're digging chunks of your flesh in a panic, all while knowing intellectually that none of it is real? When I first started working in the hospital, I was sitting with this sweet little old woman. I had sat with her, talking about her family and such for six hours. Towards the end of my shift, 9 p.m., they decided she didn't need to have a heart monitor, so they transferred her to a different unit. Once we got under the new room, she started acting differently, just generally angrily, I would say. Then all of a sudden, she tried to jump out of the bed, a big no-no at hospitals. I immediately got up to stop her. She started screaming bloody murder about how her house was on fire and her family was inside and she needed to get them out. I tried to calm her down but to no avail. She started yelling at me about how I'm going to rot in the flames of hell because God told her so and how I was responsible for her family's death. Staring deep into my eyes, she told me about how I will burn in eternal flames and that I am filled with evil. I thought, okay, at least she isn't worried about her family or trying to get out of bed. But then she started screaming at the top of her lungs in what I can only describe as Latin, or maybe even gibberish. She then ripped out her dentures, threw them at me, and pulled all of the skin on her face back into this long, stretched out, creepy smile. She let out a blood-curdling scream with her eyes rolled back into her head like some sort of possession scene in a movie. Just as she let up, my relief came into the room. I wished her luck and booked it out of there. The second I got off of that unit, I called my mom and cried for a good 15 minutes. I still think of her stretched out face sometimes. I work in an ER, 
And due to my country and state's poor mental health system, we see acute psychotic episodes daily. Over time, you get desensitized to it. But there is still one that turns my stomach. A guy was found in a burning abandoned building. He wasn't hurt, but was acting so strange the paramedics brought him in. He was homeless, had no ID, did not know his name, and had zero drugs in his system. Looking into his eyes, you could tell that he wasn't seeing the same thing I was. So I'm trying to get his name or anything out of him, and he keeps telling me that he was a pilot for the Air Force and flew experimental planes because he could withstand the G-force and his blood was naturally thin. The blood tests that measure this actually were fairly higher than normal, but not elevated to the point that he was on medication for it, so he was right on that account. I was at the desk telling a co-worker about the stuff this guy was saying when a resident overheard me. He was former Air Force as well, and looked like he had seen a ghost. As soon as I mentioned the name of the base, this doctor freaked out. He said that that city slash base had no roads in or out, and a lot of top secret testing goes down there. He said that you don't know about it unless you've been there. He told me not to talk about it or make a big deal. This gave me an even weirder vibe. I was a med student back then. I was with my group mates, three girls and me, assigned to a psych institution when we interviewed our subject. This is how it went. Me. Hi, how are you today? Subject, I'm fine. Me, that's great. So I'll ask you a few questions to get to know you better. Is that okay? That's fine. It's been a while since I've talked to people from the outside. Cool, you can always talk to us, so don't worry. How'd you end up here? Did you do drugs or any substance abuse? No, I just hear someone whispering in my ear. A lot of them. Oh, so what do they say? A lot of things, actually. Different things. So are you hearing them now? Yes, they never stop. What are they telling you? They're telling me that I need to kill you. Me and my groupmate stood up and took a step back while looking at him with fear. Him. Oh, don't be scared. I know they're bad. I'm not going to follow them. We stayed standing up for the next five minutes, which seemed like hours, still asking him questions. It ended well, and we all shared a laugh afterward. But damn. Just... Damn. When I was in my graduate program, my favorite professor gave us a warning. She said she knew at least some of us would soon work at a particular psychiatric ward, since there were only a few of them in our area, and she knew the staff were not always properly alerted to the dangers of this one patient. Apparently, years earlier, a teenage boy had attacked his parents with a knife. He believed aliens had invaded the bodies of numerous humans, including his parents, and he was the only one who could recognize these aliens hiding in the human hosts. He was convinced if he could not just cut open one person to reveal the alien inside, he could save the world. Aside from this one single delusion, he seemed perfectly normal and pleasant. The problem was with newer staff members who were unaware of his past, and more experienced staff members who had been sufficiently warned, but just couldn't believe this sweet, polite young man could really pose still a threat. You didn't want to be the one who naively gave this guy a sharp object, or even a ballpoint pen only to have him look in your eyes and see the twinkle of what he believed was an alien hiding inside. He absolutely would attack you without warning. I don't know many details of the case, just that his parents did survive. This happened in South Mississippi, and my professor said that he would likely never be released.
I'm going anonymous on this one to protect the privacy of another person. My ex-wife was referred to a psychiatrist after a self-harm incident. When I took her to the emergency room, they asked her what had happened and why she did it. As they were treating her, a doctor pulled me aside and told me that she was exhibiting behaviors that indicated serious mental illness and recommended inpatient evaluation and treatment in a psychiatric hospital. During the intake interview, we sat with a psychiatrist. I was seated slightly out of my wife's line of sight. He would ask her questions, then sneak a glance at me. I would nod if her answers were factual and shake my head if they weren't. He was trying to determine her grasp of reality and whether she represented a danger to herself or others. Then we got to this one. The doctor asked her, Do you ever hear or see things that other people don't? Wife, I hear voices, like I'm sitting in a stadium with everyone talking at once. I nodded. She had told me about having head noises. Doctor, these voices, do they say anything specific? He's writing notes on a legal pad, barely looking up at this point. Wife, they say, kill the children, kill the children. He can barely conceal his shock, but gently asks, Do you have any children? Wife. Well, not anymore. His eyes almost fell out of his head. I quickly told him that we have no children alive nor dead. Wife. Well, just because I'm crazy doesn't mean that I can't crack a joke. She assured the doctor that she never actually heard the voices say anything specific and that the stadium statement was accurate. The doctor was very relieved and told her that her ability to maintain a sense of humor was a good sign. She was eventually diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, among other things. After hospitalization and treatment, she was able to manage her illness and live a productive life. She's now married to a great guy, and we all remain friends. But she still doesn't have any children. I was in a psych ward for 10 days for attempting to unalive myself. I had the most terrifying experience of my life there. I was only 17 at the time and in a pretty bad mental state, which made the following even more disturbing for me. On the first day that I got there, I was assigned a roommate named John. He seemed pretty nice at first and showed me around the hospital and helped me out while I was new. Something didn't seem right about him though. He would stare into the distance for long periods of time open mouth, drooling, until I eventually asked if he was okay. The second night I was there, he informed me that he was a Satan worshiper and had the ability to talk to the devil. This kind of freaked me out, mainly because he claimed that the devil and other demons were whispering to him all the time. This disturbed me, and I started to keep my distance from him. He stayed in our room, which, by the way, had its own private bathroom for most of the evening, while I played basketball with the other patients to relax. When I had come in for the night and went to my room, I noticed that John wasn't in bed and the bathroom door was locked. Then it struck me that the room had been absolutely demolished. The beds were on its side, and on the back of the headboard was a huge pentagram carved into the wood. Naturally, I started to be concerned, so I knocked on the bathroom door. I heard John making really weird noises and talking to someone in there. I waited 20 minutes to see if he came out, but he didn't. The weird noises that he was making grew louder, and he kept laughing and talking to someone, or something. Eventually I decided to open the bathroom door, because they did not have locks on the inside, so patients couldn't hide. When I opened the door, I saw John covered in blood, naked on the floor, eyes wide open staring at me. He had smashed the mirror in the bathroom and used the shards to carve deep gashes up his arms and legs. There was blood everywhere. I thought he was going to die, so I immediately rushed in and tried to help him. Big mistake. When I came near, he grabbed my arm and stabbed me with a piece of the mirror. I screamed, which caused the nurses to come in, rushing, and restrain him. He was laughing like a madman. 
They brought him to the hospital for his cuts and I got stitches. I later got a new room and a new roommate. The weirdest part, he came back seven days later, but stayed in a different ward for psychotics. He came up to me at dinner and had no recollection of the event. That was the most terrifying week of my life. Anyone else ever had crappy seclusion rooms or isolation cell experiences? They really try to hide something with a name, but it's not hiding much. The one I was thrown in had blue rubber on every surface and a tiny drain in one corner of the door. But the worst thing was the smell. It stank of old sweat and pee, and I would soon find out why. Within an hour of being there, I needed to go to the bathroom real bad, so I pressed the emergency call button and the nurse told me that that didn't sound like a medical emergency and left me even when I was yelling and started yelling incoherently at the door. Eventually, I had to go so bad that I peed all over the area with a little drain, which didn't help the smell. The food was literally like Lunchables cut up smaller, and I could hardly stomach it in the cell. After a doctor's checkup, they put me back in with nothing but a stiff, scratchy blanket and the same paper scrubs. I tried to sleep, and was only able to for a few minutes because of the bright lights and hard mattress that was the same rubber material as the floor. Around what felt like half a day in, my stomach started killing me, and I evacuated my bowels into the already filthy floor. There was no way to feel clean like this, so I flew into a fit of despair and anger yelling at the door that I want a bath now, and pressed the button which called a different nurse over who said there were no showers at this time. The best they could do was throw me a wet washcloth, which I used to try and feel clean. But it was impossible to not feel nasty lying in a tiny room with your own feces and pee inches away from where you lie down. I felt like a caged animal trapped in their own filth. And it makes me want to shower, even now. I've had three psych stays. I'm going to be 18 in a couple of months, and I'm coming up on the anniversary of my worst psych hospital experience ever. The facility was dirty. The staff yelled at me and other patients and lied to me. My psychiatrist was a jerk and tried to hold me there indefinitely, and staff would just say stop it and get annoyed at you if you self-harmed. I had a roommate who punched herself in the head for two hours and screamed slurs and cussed out anyone who tried to talk to her while I was essentially stuck in a room with her due to it being nighttime. There was a staff member right in the doorway the whole time and they didn't do anything. But when I was scratching myself as SH and didn't stop after a couple of warnings, they decided to sedate me. I begged them not to and I was told that I could either sit still and get my injection in my shoulder or be held down and have my pants and underwear pulled down and get the injection in my gluteus. They didn't get permission from my parents, which is technically illegal since it wasn't an emergency situation, and I fainted and hit my head on a table shortly afterwards. My arm was sore for three weeks after that, sometimes to the point of tears. The groups were pretty much non-existent, and there was a teacher who came in to supposedly make up for us missing school, and he treated us like idiots. Their eating disorder protocol was essentially slopping an insure in front of you then forcing you to sit in the common room by yourself with it and yelling at you until you drank it. The longest I sat with an insurer in the common room in my eight-day stay was probably around two and a half hours. Patients would also be placed on room time, where they wouldn't be allowed to leave their room at all, and no one could talk to them for 24 hours minimum if they did something that staff didn't like. Anyway, there's my rant. I don't know how to cope with this experience even though I know that it could have been way worse.
So I had broken up with my abusive alcoholic ex when they were safe in rehab. I had isolated myself from everyone, all of my friends, my roommates. The only person that I spent time with was my ex. I noticed things too late. I tried breaking up with them, and they would go out and get so drunk that they would get hospitalized. I felt trapped and so alone. They decided to go to rehab, so I helped. I was so worried every day, but they couldn't care less. They got a new routine and would get upset when I would remind them to take it slow. They were hospitalized due to alcohol-related illnesses about five times right before rehab. Anyway, I broke up with them when I knew it would be safe. The guilt and shame overcame me. I wanted everything to stop. Luckily, I asked for help. Sadly, it took a lot of convincing to have them admit me. Crazy, right? I say I want to die, and they say it's a passive thought. I told them that when I was on the freeway, I would think of just swerving. Anyway, finally, I get admitted. It's super late. No one explains anything to me. They ran out of clothes, so I was in one of those hospital robe things. I was so out of it. All I could think about was them, and what if they were out drinking, and how I would have to go back to my apartment to my roommates. Okay, moving on. I'm just trying to stay afloat. I get there pretty late, so I just go straight to my room. One of my roommates is sobbing, saying how mean this group is. She said she's glad that she's going home, but knows she'll be back. My other roommate is annoyed trying to sleep. She was basically detoxing, and her meds make her sleepy. The person who was leaving warned me about certain people, and said the fastest way to get out was to go to all the optional activities. So the next day I did. I woke up early and went to group. Halfway through the day, I got a new roommate. She was younger and super cool. We ended up just sticking together the whole time. I tried my best to give her space sometimes so that she didn't feel like I was dependent. We're out in the courtroom having dinner, and this guy comes up to us. Totally normal conversation. And then he looks at us and says, stop pretending. He said we were hired to be there, and we weren't actually sick. He told us that it was a matrix situation and that we weren't actually there. I don't know, I hadn't slept in two days and at first we laughed, but then he got mad and aggressive. I was so confused and then that made me just shut down because they booty juiced him. I went to groups but still kept my distance. This other guy got aggressive and almost hit us with a chair. None of the staff would help anyone unless they made a scene so I got close to screaming whenever I was ignored. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't remember the point of this, but it's almost been a year, and I rarely talk about it, but I think about it all the time. So, the psych ward that I was taken to in Texas uses the same restraints as the Texas Death Chamber, which is pictured in the news infrequently. I don't know why I don't just have traumatic nightmares about the psych ward experiences themselves, but those dreams are rare. Instead, I have dreams about being put to death in the Texas Death Chamber. I doubt I have company in this very specific reoccurring nightmare, but I would find comfort in not being alone. This incident happened back in 2014, when I was last committed to a psych ward for a self-unaliving attempt. A little background. I am a female and was 19 at the time. I was coming off of three years of bipolar medication while at a peak of substance abuse facilitated by my first year in college, going crazy with new adult freedom. One night, I had a big mental episode and was committed for the first time in the adult ward. Previously, I'd only been admitted in the minor's ward during my adolescence for similar episodes. 
Within this unit, you had to share a room with the same sex, but weren't given any proper introductions. The facility as a whole wasn't managed effectively, nor did any of the nurses or doctors seem to care, other than to prescribe you medication and get you out. I was led into the room that I was staying in, and the nurse just said to the other lady in the room, this is your new roommate, and left. The woman appeared to be in her late 40s, early 50s, Hispanic and just a little taller than me. She would not keep her gaze off of the floor in front of her, and didn't say a word or move when I said hi. I noticed she had a cartoon version of the classic Red Devil tattooed onto her, but as a baby. I figured I'd just leave her alone and stick to my area of the room. The first night went as they normally do in a psych ward, with a nightly group and my roommate declining to share anything, yet again only staring at the floor barely moving an inch. While everyone was lining up to be given their medication before bed, the ward across from us began to start banging on the glass of the door and screaming. One guy was smiling while banging his bald head against the glass window part, while the guys behind him were screaming and jumping around. It seemed as if they were almost going to break through, but orderlies came and took them away with their screams still lingering through the halls. Being in psych wards before, I wasn't surprised by out-of-the-ordinary behavior like yelling or fights starting, but this was completely different to me. I was with disturbed adults now, people who had years of illness deteriorating their mind, not just little angry kids anymore. I actually felt scared for the first time because of the high level of unpredictability with these people. I knew I wasn't all there in the head, but even these people had me anxious and made it difficult to try to get any rest that night. You know that feeling of being awake, but you haven't opened your eyes yet? The moment where you're barely waking up and everything is fuzzy? This is the state of consciousness that I was in later that night. I felt like I was waking up, but as if something was waking me up, yet still tired so I wasn't opening my eyes. The more I came to, I felt pressure on my forehead, and I could sense sweat dripping on my face. I opened the eyes to find the roommate standing over me, staring me in the eye with one hand on my forehead and the other in a balled up fist on her chest while she speaks in what I assume is tongues. I looked into her eyes, and they are blank and empty of any emotion. She keeps speaking faster and getting louder. I am paralyzed at this moment, not sure what to do or what she would even do if I were to yell or move. It was only us in the room, and the nurse's station is all the way out at the end of the hall. She started wiping the sweat off my forehead, while still speaking fast and erratic, and I wasn't sure what she was doing or planning on doing next. She then put both hands on my forehead, and at this point was screaming while shaking me, but not long before a nurse came in and took her off of me. The nurse seemed more irritated that she had to get up and do her job rather than concerning of how I was doing or feeling. She escorted the woman out and said don't worry and just go back to sleep. I don't know how, but I did manage to fall back asleep. I assume she got transferred to the more severe ward because I did not see her again the next day, and luckily, I was able to leave later that day. This incident has since been a reminder for me to never go back and to manage my mental well-being, because while I have issues, I could be in a far worse state of mind. I still wake up some nights with lingering anxiety and have to calm myself down and go back to sleep. I never want to go back to a ward in my life to experience this again, or potentially something far worse. I was admitted to a behavioral hospital in Utah about a year and a half ago. It was Sunday and they didn't do discharges on the weekends, so the whole adult psych unit was full and I was placed in overflow. I was initially placed in a detox unit, which was fine. It was dual diagnosis, so whatever. It was right before dinner, and I had just enough time to put my clothes in my room. My roommate was sleeping in her bed with a Bible under her pillow, and in the opposite way anyone would normally sleep. Her head was at the foot of the bed. I didn't think much of it, just hoping she wasn't going to try to convert me while we shared a room. 
The next morning I wake up and my roommate is already awake leaving the shared bedroom. I introduce myself. She says her name. It started with an S and everything seemed fine. She looked a bit disheveled, but that's kind of normal in a psych unit. Skinny, stringy blonde hair, a bit older than me. Her bed was on the other side of the room. And while I'm still sitting on my bed, she trips over hers. Oh my God, are you okay? I asked. She suddenly turned very angry and responded, no, of course I'm not. Don't ever make me do that again. You and your evil witchcraft. Dumbfounded and startled, I got ready as quick as possible and sat in the day room waiting to be taken down for breakfast and filling out a patient check-in sheet. She eventually came out of the room after I had told a few others to be cautious due to what I had just experienced. And she started taking all the pamphlets and artwork off the wall and proceeded to throw them away. It was extremely unnerving not knowing exactly what this woman was capable of, other than extreme anger. I eventually got checked out by the doc and I told her, look, you need to move me to the correct unit or move her. I don't feel safe and I will not sleep if you keep me in the same room as her. Fortunately, the doc acknowledged that I was not detoxing and since it was now Monday, there had been enough discharges to move me to the adult psych unit. Great. They ended up moving her to the CSU floor, meant for more severely mentally ill and dangerous people who were not allowed to interact in the cafeteria with any other units. It ended up just being an interesting story to tell people when I finally left, and everything seemed hunky-dory, till just over a year later. I was working the night shift at a hotel and stopped by a 7-Eleven on my way home late at night. I saw someone with a hood up and talking to themselves in the parking lot. I sat in my car for a moment because I'm obviously cautious, even though this was not the scary part of the county. They flipped their hood off their head, and I recognized immediately who it was. It was S. She was talking to herself and pacing back and forth. I carefully walked past her into the 7-Eleven hoping she wouldn't recognize me. I explained to the clerk in the store that I was going to hang out for a second, and explained everything to him. She left after a few minutes and I sped off to get home and drink a beer that I had bought. I haven't seen her since, and I hope to never meet her again. That scared the living daylights out of me. So this was when I was like 17. I was staying in the psychiatric emergency care unit at the hospital. It's for short stays, a week at most. They evaluate you and see whether they're going to ship you off to the proper psych hospital or send you on your way. Most people in this section aren't like crazy crazy. Usually it's just self unaliving attempts, people who had short manic episodes, drug or alcohol fueled psychosis or whatever. Anyway, it was a small area. It had a rec room, a short hall with six or seven rooms, the nurse's office being behind glass at the end of the hall next to the rec room, and then like a little outside bit. Each person had their own room, and above the room was a light, and if the light was on, it meant there was movement in the room. I have a creepy story regarding that, but not the relevant sub. One night, I convinced multiple nurses to give me a Valium before bed. We'd usually be given one or two, but going up to multiple nurses, I managed to hustle about eight. I was laying in bed, completely zoned out from the Valium with my hand over my eyes. I had left my light still on, when at one point I hear my room door open. I assumed it was a nurse checking on me, but I was so completely zoned out I didn't move my hand and just peeked through a tiny crack between my fingers. It wasn't a nurse. It was the dude in the room next to mine. He was crouched down like a frog stance, kind of shuffling over by my bed, still in that position. I didn't move. I was pretty wigged out. But I was in such a haze that I thought I was still dreaming. He was directly beside my bed, crouched down, head in his hands. He was whispering stuff. Creepy stuff. And inaudible nonsense. It took some time to process, but then I swung my hand off my eyes and sat up, and he jumped up and ran out of my room. At this point, the nurses noticed. One nurse followed him, 
and one came into my room and questioned me. I explained everything. I was still calm from the Valium and insisting there wasn't an issue and that I just wanted to go to sleep. I don't know what they said or did to him. When I woke up the next day, he was completely normal and asked me if I wanted to play cards. I'm a 21 year old female with a whole bunch of baggage. I've struggled with my mental health my entire life. And last year I was admitted to an acute psychiatric hospital. I've only recently been discharged without blogging about my life. I went through some tough, dark times. Luckily I managed to get out and after seven admissions, I'm ready to reenter the world. Anyways, my final admission was to a ward that I've been to a couple times before. I'll not name it for obvious reasons, but it was in the Midlands. I knew the staff and many of the patients there. Sure, it was difficult and tumultuous at times, but most people strive to make it as bearable as possible. The daily routine, at least in UK psych wards, is usually the same. Wake up, take meds, eat food, watch TV, take meds, eat food, take a nap, optional, eat food, take meds, go to sleep. You get the gist. It's super boring. So one day I came back to my room just after breakfast to see Karen, the usual ward cleaner standing in my room, staring out of my window and looking fairly startled. Now when you work as a cleaner on a psych ward, you see some stuff. So I knew something was up. Uh, hey Karen, what's going on? She explained that while she was cleaning my room, she had seen a thin middle-aged man wearing sunglasses and carrying a backpack walk past the room a couple times. She said that something seemed off about him. I sort of shrugged it off because he may have well just been a lost patient, as they usually look off. So I went about my day as usual. Then, at around midday, I went to grab something from my window shelf and was suddenly face to face with this middle-aged man wearing glasses. And yeah, a backpack. He didn't look especially freaky, just a normal lanky looking guy. Still, I freaked out and ran from the room. The windows were tinted, so I'm fairly sure that he couldn't have seen me, but it still gave me quite a fright. During the next few days, a number of patients and staff members saw him walk past numerous windows, which was especially strange because the ward was fenced off so that your average bystander wouldn't and couldn't find themselves near the unit. We all wondered whether he was just a curious adventurer or if it was something a bit more sinister. Three days after the initial encounter, I'd kind of forgotten about the whole thing and went to bed with my window slightly cracked. It wouldn't be open the whole way and the ward was often boiling. I'm aware that I might have just imagined this, but I swear that around 1am I woke up and heard something tapping on my window. I tried to look through the window but it was dark so all I could see was my own reflection. But I freaked out, shut the window, and told the night staff what was up. That morning, numerous patients were complaining of weird noises during the night, including tapping and sometimes heavy breathing. One girl even swore that she heard him slash someone try to open her window further. But this was on a psych ward, so I took it with a pinch of salt. Anyway, security was up for the next few days, and we never saw him again. For some background information, about two years ago, I had to go to a psychiatric facility so I could deal with my depression issues. At this time, I was a 14-year-old girl. I was at the hospital for three days when all of this started. The third day I was there, I woke up with an awful stomach ache. I convinced the nurses to let me stay in from the activities and sleep off the pain. So I'm alone in the hospital, plus the staff, when the patient phone starts ringing. I run over to answer, thinking it would be my boyfriend calling but instead, it's a man's voice that I don't recognize. Can I talk to Sandra? I was the only patient there, so I said she wasn't there. Oh, all right, thanks. 
Who is this? The voice sounded a lot like my friend's dad, who I had just met the night before during visiting hours. I told him my name, figuring he would recognize it. What are you in here for? I told him it was personal. This started to raise red flags for me because I had told my friend's dad why I was there the night before. Did you fight to get in here, like beat up other girls? I said no, and I was quickly becoming freaked out. It took a few more personal questions for me to realize that there was no Sandra at the hospital. I wasn't sure on everyone's names, but I definitely hadn't heard Sandra before. I really started becoming uncomfortable, and I told him I had to go, and that was that. Visiting hours came around, and there's a phone call for me. A man asking for me, saying it was my dad. But my dad was sitting right next to me. I explained that he had called earlier, and my dad was pissed. He went over to the phone and demanded to know who was calling. The man didn't say anything and hung up. After a couple more calls asking for me by name, I told the hospital staff. They became very concerned, and we weren't allowed to answer the phones for a while. Apparently, a convicted R-wordist had been calling the mental hospital for years, getting names of the girls who answer the phone. He then uses whatever information he learns from the girls and calls back continually, posing as their dad or boyfriend. Apparently, he even tried to pick up patients a couple times. The weirdest part is, when you call the hospital, you have to know the birthday of the patient that you are trying to reach, or the staff won't put the call through. So he somehow knew a bunch of crazy teenage girls' info and used it to prey on us when we least expected it. I definitely freaked the F out, seeing as he should have been the one in the hospital. Over the past year, I've been in and out of hospitals for mental and physical reasons. I was in a hospital in Massachusetts, an award for psych and poor vital signs. Even though this was in a children's hospital, adults were in the ward too. In this ward, there were some pretty messed up people. It was the adults that were the most unhealthy. They were the creepers that are too nice, or the ones that never leave their room. I was with the adolescents, and we never had freakouts, considering it was a psych ward for children. The adults, however, they were off. Weekends were visiting days. My dad would come on Saturdays and my mom on Sundays because my parents were separated. So it was Sunday and many patients were there with their visitors in a large visiting room with couches, art supplies, and a TV. In this ward, there were people with eating disorders. So we had to have three meals and three snacks a day, but the adolescents ate in a different room than the adults. The adolescents ate in the visiting room, and we couldn't eat with our visitors. We also couldn't watch the staff prepare any of our meals and snacks. It was snack time, and all the patients and visitors had to leave the visiting room. The visitors went to a meeting, and the patients had to stand in the corridor while we waited for our snack. There was one adult, standing at the end of the corridor near the entrance of the ward. She was probably only 18 or 19 years old, but was still put in as an adult. Anyway, this girl was standing near this really secure door that you needed a card to scan yourself in or out. The girl was crying, saying that there was a man at the door. I looked at the door, which had a small, narrow window, and I saw the silhouette of a person. I got a sick feeling in my stomach, and I think others saw it too, because all of the patients looked nervous. Another adult patient was comforting the girl by hugging her tightly, which isn't allowed in the ward. Staff saw and heard this and rushed over to the woman and the girl to help. They gently began to separate the girl from the woman, but once the two weren't together anymore, the girl had a flip out and screamed at the top of her lungs and reached for her comfort. Yes, this was in a psych ward, and yes, this is common in situations like this, but this girl was usually mellow and quiet. She was a bit zany, but sane. But this scream, it was ear-piercing and disturbing. I never heard a scream like the one that girl did. Staff rushed to restrain her, and they pushed us into the visiting room. I was last to get pushed in the visiting room, but just as I went through the doorway, I saw the door open just enough so that the metal lever squeaked, and I saw the silhouette, 
move away. I don't know what that girl saw, but whatever it was, it has scarred that girl. And it was a mystery to all of us. Thank you everyone for joining me for this video. And I want to give a special shout out to all of our channel members. Thank you so much, Maxine Gentile, Inner Scare Wifey Simp, Pilot, Vanita Tillman, Sarah Rodriguez, Shane Wilson, Sarah Rudd, Jacob Ryumi, Claire, Sherry Uchel, Sane Loggins, Martha APS, Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Inner Scare Wifey, Chili MC, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, The Grim Reaper's Nightmare, Miss Cannabis, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Anon Q, Skin Crawler, Taryn, Hail Mary, Ruby Wilson, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Jennifer Moyer, Cappy Karma, Paul Reese, Via Mash K0101 and Honey Pond. Thank you all so much for being members, and thank you to everyone who watches likes, comments, subscribes, everything. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. This has been Inner Scare with another video, and I hope you all enjoy the extra rain at the end. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.